Behind the Shades. Hello, Bayonle. How are you doing today, my friend? I am amazing. Uh, thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, I've, I've been I've been looking forward to this, and uh, here we are. So let's go. Thank you. I want to say that it's always something that's close to my heart when I can have another male guest who can speak about such a very important topic, such as fathers showing up, being leaders, leaders showing up, and how we can actually address some of the absent fathers in the world or fatherlessness, as we like to call it. So are you ready to have this type of conversation with me today? I mean, I, I don't I wouldn't say it any other way that this is what I am born for. Uh, but uh, is a, is a discussion I'm very passionate about, very, very passionate about. And you said it, too, that uh, you're always very excited when you discuss with another male, because uh, for us, we see it, I think, uh, more internally. And it is much more personal to us, uh, probably due to our own development ourselves as a human being, as a child becoming a man or as a father, uh, fathering a lot of kids that is ours and not ours. Uh, so it's um it's an it's, it's a discussion I'm excited about. So yes, I'm ready to discuss it. Perfect, perfect. So do me a favor because I cannot wait to start this conversation. But introduce yourself, let people know who you are, where they can find you, and let's get right into this beautiful conversation today. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Bayon Le Arashi. I am a Nigerian immigrant. Uh, I came to the United States uh, early 2015, February 2015 to be precise. Um, I came hopefully hope, hoping to um, have a better life, uh, just like many other immigrants in the past. I'm the first generation uh, immigrant for my own family. Um, I'm a leadership coach. Uh, leadership is a very personal subject. Uh, but before I move into leadership coaching, uh, I'm a broadcaster. I've been in broadcasting since 1999 after uh, my technical college education um, in Nigeria. I work with uh, two of the biggest uh, broadcast channels in Nigeria. Uh, and I covered a couple of Africa Cup of Nations as a sports broadcaster because sports was my uh, personal area of focus. Uh, I cover live soccer events. We call it football, but Americans love to call it soccer. Uh, that's my training. And also, I'm an entrepreneur. I started um, a soccer academy called Midas Football Academy in 2008 after traveling ac across the world and Africa. I was I've been very fortunate to... Um, be discovered and be mentored by uh, people that were able to discover me and that were able to pour into my life. And I'm hoping that because those people poured into my life, I can also pay it forward by pouring into other young men as well. Um, since I've been in the United States and I couldn't find broadcasting job because, <clears throat> excuse me, I could not probably have more education because I saw that the system, how it plays uh, here, that um, for you to get more education, you don't have to pick out a loan. I'm not a fan of that. Um, so I choose a different path. Um, I have, I did some odd jobs when I came in, Amazon, FedEx, um, name them. And finally, I found myself in criminal justice system um, and uh, work in the criminal justice uh, over the almost, almost for seven years now. Uh, also, I do soccer refereeing as a way for me to get into the sport I'm very passionate about. I'm just doing a freelancing, uh, helping young uh, guys to mentor them on the soccer field and make them a better person. And my work in the criminal justice further confirm my own purpose um, that, OK, this is what I'm meant for, to be able to mentor all the younger people. And that was what inspired me to start developing to start developing my leadership skills, uh, reading a lot of books, um, talking to a lot of mentors, meeting mentors through their work. Um, Dr. Miles Moro is one of my biggest influence. Jim Rohn is one of them. Tony Robbins, uh, Dr. Leslie Brown. These are people that I learned from their work. I've met them physically, a couple of them. Unfortunately, I didn't meet Dr. Miles Moro before he passed. And these people inspired my work. I am available on all social media platforms. My name, Bayonle Arashi, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, name them. And that's the little about me. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing, because I want to make sure that <clears throat> everyone knows where to reach you, where to find you, because this conversation, as I mentioned, is very important. So let's get right into it. And what I want to ask you, 
because I'm a person that grew up without my mother and my father and I was raised by my grandmother. So I understand how difficult, how painful it can be not having your parents around. So we're going to speak about fatherlessness and why that is so rampant, more so maybe in some communities versus others. So what is the genesis of the work that you do when it comes to trying to bring awareness to what is going on with fathers who may not be in the household for a number of reasons? Absolutely. Um, Before I came into the state, um, I I never thought of it as a big issue, even though I've always seen uh, some traits of it in uh, the way some people behave, uh, some young men and the way they react in terms of their level of emotional intelligence. Uh, and of course, as an entrepreneur who has a soccer academy, and I have a lot of young teenage boys coming to the academy to train and develop, and some of them, the way they behave. Uh, but when I uh, started my job, my work in the criminal justice system, um, it was a big eye opener. America is a big, 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 big country. Uh, the state of Texas, in itself, in terms of landmass, is bigger than the entire country that I come from, Nigeria, in terms of land land mass. Um, So that was a big exposure for me. And when I started doing my work, I I told myself I wanted to be more than a correctional officer. I wanted to be more than a prison guard, as they call us. Uh, So I started studying the pattern um, because uh, as someone that is coming from a different profession as a broadcaster, and now working in the criminal justice system is a totally opposite uh, experience for me. So I started studying that what, what is all of this about? Uh, seeing men uh, more or less in a cage, that's the way I see them. And some of them can't seem to get out of it. Uh, some of them keep repeating the pattern. Um, an average uh, uh, inmate in the state of Texas, I can talk about that because I work in that system, does not realize how bad he is going until at least they are uh, reincarcerated for minimum three times. Uh, So the rate of uh, recidivism is very high. Uh, Most of them start having a better understanding and start asking the questions after they've been, after they come back like three, four times. And most of the time I also observe after their 40th birthday, uh, when you see an immigrant uh, in their 40, uh, an inmate in their 40s, uh, you start hearing a different experience experience from them. Some of them have started doing time since when they were 16, 17. And this, that was what drove my curiosity. And I, I kept asking myself and the inmates, what happened? And I, and I observed that many of them, at least out of 20, uh, maybe one uh, ever grew up with a father. Uh, so that is what I think uh, is the, the big, big issue that we have, especially in America. I can talk about America and Texas, because that's where I work. That's my understanding. That's what I have seen firsthand. Uh, and also through books I've read as well. Um, some of the mentors I've had in the past, I've also noticed that they mentioned them that uh, the system does not give any kind of support, any kind of protection to the male men uh, in America. Uh, Again, I said I said America because I live here and I work there. Uh, because just imagine, all it takes for you uh, to probably be locked up is for somebody to accuse you uh, of a particular thing that that might not be proved immediately, uh, but you're going to be arrested and you're going to be put in jail. And only when you are able to prove uh, your innocence uh, is when you're able to make it out. But most of the time, you are not able to prove that innocence. So how can we stop this pattern? How can we stop? Uh, this issue it is by teaching men how to find their purpose early in life how to channel that youthful energy that every young boys have into something that will uh, most likely uh, transcend into something that can better their life so go into sports learn a trade uh, learn a vocation and that's what my work is all has been all about going to um, elementary middle and high school talking to young boys and girls and letting them know the importance of uh, uh, finding their purpose early in life and why if you are born here uh, as an American I wasn't born here I know how long it took me to be able to come out uh, to be able to say I want to work uh, so if you are born here with all that advantage uh, you should not make a mess of that. And I'm going to piggyback on that and say that what I look for, if I'm talking about men and women in the household, is 
You want the support from the woman when you're raising your kids, and you want the strength from the man when you're raising your kids. And you want to divide that and say, hey, I can go to one person because they have this in abundance. I can go to the other person because they have this in abundance. But when you have one of that dynamic out of the household, there's an imbalance. And now you're asking someone to do everything. And single mothers and single fathers do a good job. But if you base it on the rates of those who are incarcerated, you begin to see a different picture. As you mentioned, you start to see that, hey, many of these inmates, they don't have one of the parents in the house. And in many cases, they don't have the father in the house where they can pull from that strength. And one thing I like to touch on when I have these types of conversations, it shows you the importance of having two people who are present. And by present, I don't mean that they're both in the household and they're not taking care of they're not taking care of the kid. You want to be physically there, but you have to also be emotionally there, yes, sir. spiritually there, verbally there, and mentally there. Yeah. Hmm. So when you speak to these young men who are trying to find their purpose, because I think we're living in a time where men have less purpose now than maybe you and I growing up, then definitely our parents and definitely our grandparents. So what are type of, what are some of the type of conversations that you're having with young adults who are trying to find their way and make sure they're not being led astray? Uh, thank you very much. And you, 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 you piggyback on it, but I, I'm also going to follow up your question uh, from, take up your question based on that point. Uh, one of the data that I also studied um, is the fact that when two uh, parents, the man and the woman this time around, um, are present at home, that child um, have more than 90% of a chance of never, ever experiencing uh, incarceration. That's number one. Uh, but, and also, I also studied, uh, it is hard to say, but it's the truth that if the father by himself raised a child, um, he also have the same amount of percentage of not being incarcerated. Um, this does not take away the strength of our mothers. Um, I am uh, someone that my mom had a very big influence in my life, and I'm very fortunate to have both of them in my life as well. But because of the way uh, the American system is designed, uh, that you have to work extremely hard to be able to pay your bills. Uh, most of the moms that are single mothers today are not able to handle that pressure. Uh, some of them have two, three jobs they have to do to be able to catch up with the bills. They have two boys that they give birth to that they have to also be a father and a mother to at the same time. Uh, so it has really, really make the uh, issue to fall back on them. And it makes it seem that many of them fail to raise successful men. We've had a few uh, that have raised successful men. And I'm sure some of the people that are watching us live or that will be listening to this podcast later uh, can verify this data. Very few mothers have managed to raise their boys right. Some of them, they gave it their best but they just could not do it all by themselves. Having said that, uh, the questions um, I let these young teenagers ask me is, why are you telling all this story? Why do you think it is your responsibility to come out and share with us what's going on behind the walls? And I tell them this, I said, one of the things I tried to do when I started working in the prison system is hoping that some of the ones that are in there um, can actually change their life. One of the uh, 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 core competency of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is to integrate, reintegrate inmates back into society and also to assist victims of crimes, right? But one of the things I observe is that many of these guys, once they come into the system, they are never the same person again. Never, I said. They are not able to come out to be normal again. Let me just put it that way. So it is very hard to see someone that is once incarcerated or maybe coming twice and still want to be a father to someone or want to work and, um, and add to the society is very difficult. Some very few percentage also 
have managed to succeed in this way. So I look at it like, I tried this a couple of times and, and I'm telling you this because this is my personal experience now. And I said, okay, if it is not working to help these guys that are here in here, okay, why can't I in my own little capacity go out there and go catch them young? Let these young ones out there be aware of what is going on behind the walls and know that do not come there. Do not waste your life away. Once you allow, once you smoke that weed, once you taste that drug, once you allow your friend to convince you to go rob that drugstore and do a quick, quick hit on someone and they lock you up, that is more or less the end of your life. Because number one, you're going to be, a, you're going to be tagged a felon for the rest of your life. When you go to prison in the state of Texas and come back out, you are not able to rent an apartment in your own name. You are not able to get any credit. Your life is literally destroyed. So for me, I do this based on passion. I do this based on um, what I think that there is so much you can do um, here um, to add to the, to the system, to add to uh, the country, to add to your own family and to be an inspiration. Uh, to younger people, just as I am hoping I can be to you. Um, and that's just uh, be the basis of my discussion with them every time I have the opportunity. So what are some of the ways that young adults can avoid getting caught up in these types of situations that's going to put them down the path of ending up either in jail or in prison in the future? That's a very complex, but a very interesting question. Um, there is no one pathway, uh, but I think the foundation of it should be, um, if you as a man um, make that decision to make a baby with a woman, uh, for you to be responsible enough, for you to uh, make that decision that, okay, it is not just me having sex with this woman and uh, making a baby, for me to want to stay in the life of that child, being a male or a female, because what we have these days, it is either a boy with a gun or a baby with a child, a baby girl with a child, uh, right? That's what we have. That is the pattern. It, and, it's, and it's a cycle. It kept repeating itself over and over and over again. You hear, I, I right now in my role, um, I have, I'm in a supervisory role. So I work with a group of uh, inmates that are trustees. Uh, we call them trustees because their custody level is the lowest. Uh, so, so they are able to work outside of the facility uh, for us to move around and help. Uh, these guys literally run the prison system. And my discussion with them, um, I got to know even more. Some of them, and it doesn't matter really, uh, race has no part to play in this. They come across all races, uh, white, black, Hispanic. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Some of them would tell me, hey, boss, that's what they call us. I have 10 children with seven baby mamas. And for me, uh, coming from where I came from, uh, the, 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 the kind of culture that I came from in Nigeria, it's a culture shock. It's, I mean, after eight years in the United States, I still suffer from culture shock, from some of the things I hear and I see, right? So that the first thing I think we can do to start is to have this basic understanding that it is not about me going from this one to this one, to this woman, from this woman. If I make one child, if that, that's the only child I can be able to uh, work with and raise with the mother or with my wife, as the case may be, for you to put in the work and do that work. The second one is hopefully there will be more people that can start coming up and be a teacher and be a mentor and, and not let, because the American system does not allow anyone to talk to you, to your child. Uh, you cannot smack your child uh, because this country was founded on the basis of God, right? In God, we trust. But you observe that over the last few years, many, many words that has to do with God is being removed. Uh, it's been taken out. I'm someone that pays attention a lot. When you go to once in a while, when I go for maybe vacation or assignment outside of the state, before you used to see the Holy Bible in, the, in, in your hotel rooms. These days, you can't find that anymore. Um, so the issue of faith is getting out. We are removing God gradually. The same God that we said 
is the foundation of the country. We are removing it gradually from the country. Uh, so we need to start going back to that. Mentors, uh, folks need to start coming up and start explaining it to these guys, to these kids that look, you have to do this. This is how to live. The third one, which I also think, which one of the things I'm also working on now, apart from me being a podcaster, starting a podcast on this discussion, inviting other young men and fathers and spiritual leaders to come and talk about fatherhood, leadership, and criminal justice on the podcast is uh, for you, for us to start encouraging these guys to channel that energy that they have. Um, a natural, a, a boy of five, six year old have an extreme high energy. Put that child into some form of sports. Let him start channeling that energy towards something that will exhaust him after school, right? So that when he leaves school and he knows he's going to play sport for one or two hours, by the time he gets home, nature will catch up with him or her and then he will be able to sleep. So the basics and fundamentals are the things we have to pay attention to and start doing. I'm a firm believer in everything that you just said, and here's why. I think if you put men and women, especially when they're young, into these programs, these resources, into these sports, you're taking them away from the street element, the influences, the addictions, and you're putting them in a more structured environment. You've played sports, you coach, and you've done that stuff. I've played sports as well. And you probably have the same experience as me. I looked at my coach as an extension of my father. Absolutely. It was that Absolutely. important. I looked at my teachers and my mentors as an extension of my father. Absolutely. Because they were there to educate me, to protect me to a degree, and to make sure that I was on the straight and, and narrow. And I remember a time where we started to move away from that where you had children running around five years old, seven years old, unsupervised, just running the streets. Mm -hmm. And then you began to see that became the norm. And we started to lose a group of people into that element because it's so addictive, right? I can do what I want. I can hang out with the older crowd. I'm getting a little bit of money, however they're getting it. And mm -hmm. they've kind of lost their way. There's a saying that to raise a child, it takes a village. It takes a village. It takes a village. It takes a village. And, and how, to, to how, really do you help, how do you help people create their village in raising that child? How? <laughs> well, thank you very much. I was about to say uh, and, and, and add to your last comment, uh, but since you already put that question to me, uh, one of the things uh, that I do um, right now, um, based on what I've watched so far, as one of my mentors, Tony Robbins, said that three things you have to focus on that has been a consistent, they have been consistent over the last 100 years is for you, number one, to study a pattern. Study what has been going on. Observe, look, just sit down and look at the world and say, okay, what is going on here? And secondly, he said, use that pattern that is big that you studied use that pattern that has been studied and make a shift out of it. And the third one, which is what you say, create a new pattern from that. That is, those are the three basic system, right? So what I have done so far is observe the pattern, which I obviously have mentioned on this podcast so far. And the pattern is very simple. The American system is not designed. People don't say this, it's not designed and it makes it very hard for a man and woman to be able to be together and raise their child because of pressure of living uh, expenses, uh, pressure of paying the bills, uh, pressure of, I mean, there's so much pressure everywhere, but you have, it takes two people um, of the same understanding. Uh, if you are a person of faith, just do your best and make sure if you're going to choose a life partner, let your partner have some of your value uh, in your life, right? Some of the value that you share, let that person have it. It could be female to male or male to female. If you guys have the same value, it's one of the ways for you to play against the system because that's all you can do. That's one. Two, after studying the pattern, now I am using that pattern. 
And what I did is to start um, a soccer academy. Um, I started a soccer academy back in my home country, Nigeria, since 2008. And the plan for it is to always use that as sport soccer academy because that's my, that's what I know. I know soccer. I don't know every sport to help young kids. Look, you want to play or you want to you want to exhaust your energy or you want to discover yourself. Come and play. So I started the same academy here as a nonprofit um, to start targeting kids that are from single homes, that are from uh, communities that are less privileged. Uh, or just anyone that is willing to use the sport um, as a way to like get away. Ages three to 13 years old and 13 to 16 year old, come and play, right? We are not asking you to pay. We are just asking you, okay, come and use this, your experience, come and take advantage of this opportunity and develop your skill. And we are not just teaching them how to play soccer alone. After every session, I give them between five, 10, 15 minutes uh, words, uh, speeches, on the importance of life skill. Um, the system, yes, we can blame the system for creating pressure, but also the system is there for you to take advantage of. There is a way for you to learn anything you want to learn. You want to learn how to build something. You want to learn how to fix something. You want to go to school and study. You want to be a scientist. America gives you that opportunity to learn. So take advantage of that. Uh, one of the patterns I've observed also is that many of these guys that go to prison, they are either influenced by their father or by their brother or an uncle on the street uh, that is into that drug selling business. And they see him uh, riding the big cars every, every day or every week. And maybe when they start getting into their teenage years, they talk to him like, hey, bro, what's going on? Hook me up, like, like what they used to use. And before you know it, the uncle hook him up, and then he starts selling drugs himself and start getting fast money. And during that period when he makes that those fast money, he's able to attract young teenage girls like him, impregnate them, and start a cycle on his own, right? Because he has some money with him to spare for that girl to take him to a bar or a club or buy him some, buy her some food or whatever the case may be. And that is the way the pattern keeps repeating itself. But if you look at that uncle and maybe you can say, oh, uncle, I'm going to a technical institute to learn mechanic how to fix auto cars. And I, I just want you to pay my way through this auto, car, auto school. I'm sure that uncle, knowing well that he is not living a decent life, will be willing to sponsor or assist or at least recommend someone that can help you out. So that on my own part, through my soccer academy, uh, we're teaching them how to play the sport and how to understand that life skill is a very important part of your way of growing up. You have to learn not just school, you also have to learn that something is waiting for you out there and life is not easy. Life is not what mom and dad told you that it is easy out there, it's gonna be rosy. No, it's not going to be. Life is hard. You have to tell them that life is hard. You will have a lot of tough decisions to make. You have a lot of sacrifice to make. You don't, ever, you don't have to aspire to be a millionaire or billionaire, but just aspire to be a good person first, a good man or a good woman, and then be able to influence your society or community positively. What are some of the ways that young men can identify the behaviors of a good man? Uh, very, very interesting question. I do ask this question uh, on my own podcast as well. And how do you identify a uh, quality of a good man? And, I'm, and I think even though I have the answer offhand, uh, but I, I'm going to read it out to you here because this is something, like I said, I'm very passionate about. Uh, there are basic things that you just have to uh, pay attention to. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have, of course, is peer pressure. Um, how to, you, and you, you have to start from there to start playing that role of letting them know that, that peer pressure exists. You can't run from it. It, it exists and you're going to experience it in school. This is where most of them experience it the most. But um, I don't want to digress from your question. One of the things you can identify as a pattern from a good man is someone that has his life in order. That's like, you see that man every morning, he has a routine. They said the recommended thing is for you to have a routine and a ritual, but at least have one of them. Most 
men that are not perfect, but are, that have it in order, have both. Uh, they have a routine and they have a ritual. Uh, maybe your morning routine is to wake up in the morning, go on your nails and say your prayer and walk out and go out. And then you have a job to go to. You come back in the evening. You're able to have time to talk to your kids or to the young kids on the street. Uh, you read books or you play some sports or you volunteer as a coach in some team. And just basic thing of showing that your life is in order. Naturally, other men are going to see you and you're going to get the respect. The second part is that be, be the strongest version of yourself. Um, it, it, it's, it's a very key part as well. Uh, you have to be a man that can defend your family. You have to be able to speak in a way that when you when you speak, you are firm. And when you when you say stuff, you mean what you're saying. You are not just saying things and then with, with a little um, um, uh, speech, somebody is able to change your mindset. The other one is that don't, just don't be a bad person. I mentioned that earlier. Be a good person. Don't be um, uh, a, a wicked person. Like I said, where I come from, just be a genuine good person. Uh, tell the truth at all times, uh, it, no matter how hard it is. The truth is the truth. Uh, but if you are able, if you lie one time, you will not have a choice but to keep lying. And as you keep lying, one day you're going to tell the same lie that you've told earlier, forgetting that you have said it before, you're going to tell it again. But if you said the truth today, next year, if somebody asks you the same question, you remember what you said, and you're going to say the same thing exactly. Uh, protect the people that you love. Uh, these are traits of that I think uh, I, men should have. You have to be uh, a protector. Uh, your, 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 your daughter, your son, your wife, or your girlfriend or fiance have to know that you got them, that if something happens, you will be there for them and that you will be responsible. I have more, but these are the simple ones I can share with you uh, based on that question. I like those because I will say that I agree with everything that you said. And the reason why is... When you mention those behaviors, each and every one of them, at least to me, came, they have a similar theme, accountability, responsibility. Yes, sir. Right. You want to be responsible for your actions, responsible for your life, and you want to be accountable to a standard. And that standard has to be high enough that it's a, it's a way to inspire other people to want to do better in their life because I've had inspiration, you're inspiring people. And my question to you in regards to that, what is something that you'd like to share with the next generation of men who are growing up confused in a very difficult world, in a very strange world at times? How, what words of, 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 of advice would you like to share with them to help them along their journey of growth? Uh, that's another excellent question. Um, there, has, there are some things that you cannot change. Um, and, and one of them is um, the fact that no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like, no matter um, your upgrowing, uh, I believe that two things are going to shape your life. Um, and it is now left for you to either use those things, those two things um, in a positive light or for you to allow them to destroy your life. Your environment is going to shape you. Uh, the environment you grow up in, no matter how you how you see it. Uh, I come from uh, the, 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 the trenches of the trenches, right? Uh, but you have that capacity uh, through the grace of God, uh, through words like this, uh, to be able to use that environment as a way to inspire yourself and be like, no, because I'm from here does not mean I have to end back there. I can go out there and become a better version of myself, right? Your environment going to change, and your experience, your life experience. People are going to have opinion, um, no matter who you are. Either you are too brilliant, or they say you are too dull, or you are not brilliant at all. Do not let people opinion. Is one. It was one of my own personal battles that I have to conquer. Not caring about what anybody says. Uh, it's it's. A difficult thing to do, but if you can do that, not worrying about what this person is saying, uh, what that person feels about me, you will be the best 
person alive. You will be the best version of yourself. Also, discovering and developing your self-esteem. I also feel this is like a very big issue. A lot of people have extremely low self-esteem uh, of especially when it, when it has to do with race in America. I see a lot of the people that when they talk about stuff, they are very, very, they get triggered by stuff. I don't care what you look like. You can be white, you can be black, you can be whatever you want. If I have an opinion or if I have a thought or if I have a, a, an experience in an area, I'm going to share my bit. I'm going to tell it to you. If you, if I think that you are a bad person, I know I can't use bad words here. I will call you a name, right? I will tell you who you are. Uh, so it is very important for every young man and woman to develop a high self-esteem. And how do you do that? One of the easiest ways for you to discover a high self-esteem is to read self-development books, self-help books. Read from the great. Uh, Zig Ziglar wrote some fantastic books that you that will help you. Uh, Tony Robbins, I've mentioned him a couple of times on this podcast, has written some extremely good books. Uh, Jim Rohn uh, is the father of them all, uh, wrote some great books, uh, and he has tons of videos online. I mean, you are living in the days of I didn't have the kind of technology they have now. I was born in the year 80. Um, I'm, four, I'm going to be 43 years old in a, in, the, in a couple of weeks. And I think to an extent, um, technology for me came at the right time because I'm in the middle of not having a lot of them. And I'm having, and I'm having all the technology in the world. Look at you and I sitting, sitting in the comfort zone of whatever we are, and we're communicating live and direct, and it is, it is real time. You have to use those tools to better your life. The tools are there for you. So you have to make use of them, develop a good self-esteem, worry less about people's opinion. They will have it anyway. So worry less about it. Do not care about what they have to say. And of course, it's very, very important for you to chase attention. Um, if you want to ever have any influence in your life, if you want to um, tell people about your, what you do, like you and I are doing right now, we have to find opportunity to tell people our story, to get out there, chase attention. And I think you're going to be all right, guys. Thank <laughs> you.